In this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about um, an advanced communication technique in molecular communication that has received some attention uh, in recent publications and experiments, and that is the use of molecular MIMO. Molecular MIMO is inspired by uh, MIMO in wireless communications, and the idea is basically the same. So in um, wireless MIMO, you have multiple transmitting receivers, multiple receiving receivers, and the idea is that at the transmitter, you can apply a different signal to both transmitting antennas and the receiving antennas receive a combination of the two signals. So what you can do is you can encode information in both the time, uh, the time and amplitude as you would do with a single uh, antenna, but also in, in, in terms of the space. So you can actually send different signals on both antennas so as to guide your signal appropriately to the different antennas. We can do something similar in MIMO and how it would work here is you would have a molecular emitter, uh, more than one molecular emitter at the transmitter. So again, these might be reservoirs and we would emit molecules into a shared fluid medium and then there would be, actually, let me draw those differently. Um, there would be two different receivers, uh, receiver volumes at the uh, receiver end. And these might count the differing number of molecules within their volume. Actually, we're not actually going to do it this way. Um, in terms of molecular MIMO, we, uh, uh, it's often assumed that the receivers are absorbing. So um, this will be a little bit unlike what we did with counting modulation previously, which is that they were non-absorbing. So um, for our purposes, you can set it up both ways, but for our purposes here, we will assume the receiver are absorbing, unlike our previous work on CSK. Now you can, if you want, set up a non-absorbing receiver for MIMO. It's just the results that I'm going to explain. The simplest results that are available are, are derived for um, absorbing receivers. Okay, so we're gonna to have to talk a little bit about spatial modulation in order to talk about this. So um, in molecular communication, we mentioned that there were many different types of modulation that you could use, and one of them was spatial modulation. So if you imagine, multiple receivers, even in one dimension, imagine multiple transmitters and receivers separated by a very large distance. So in other words, you would have a transmitter over here, releasing molecules into the environment and a receiver volume and a different one. So a long distance away, a different one, potentially releasing molecules into the environment and a receiver volume over here. Um, you could potentially you could send a symbol by selecting 
which receiver to use. That's the idea of spatial modulation. I mean, that is to, uh, that's a very simple way of describing any kind of spatial modulation which is to say that if I want to send a zero, maybe I'll send a molecule from this emitter and presumably it will then arrive at this receiver. If I want to send a one, perhaps I will send, uh, I will release a molecule from this emitter and it will be received at this receiver. And if there is a sufficiently long distance here, there is practically no chance that these will uh, that these will cross, that in other words, that something released from here will arrive there or vice versa. Um, so that is the basic idea. We, we generally do not see spatial modulation in isolation. Instead, it's combined with other forms of modulation. But first, I'm going to think a little bit about um, about um, a communication system, molecular communication. In higher dimensions. So, so far. We have restricted ourselves. to 1D systems. And this is done for convenience uh, and because they are uh, easy to analyze. Um, a 1D, I would like to point out a 1D system can be mapped to a 3D system as follows. So assume that um, the medium, uh, excuse me, Let, let's define, sorry, let me back up, define um, the x direction as the original 1D um, axis of propagation. So as long as the system looks identical, in the Y and Z, directions, <clears throat> uh, the system is identical. Uh, the 3D system is identical to the 1D system. So this is just a way of thinking about how to map from the 1D systems that we've talked about to 3D systems, and then we can generalize. So what I mean by this is originally we had this. So uh, there's your transmitter at the origin. And then um, depending on whether we had an absorbing or a non-absorbing receiver, in any case, its boundary was here, the first boundary, Rx boundary. So in three dimensions, what does this look like? What this looks like is that this would be the X direction. And then you have two more directions, the um, Y and Z directions. So basically everything has to look exactly the same in Y and Z. In other words, if I take any coordinate in Y or in Z, uh, the boundary is still distance D away. In other words, the boundary now becomes is a plane in Y and Z. Uh, 
So if I try to draw this in three dimensions, I might not succeed, but here would be the origin. So the transmitter is still here. And the, um, the receiver will still be located D away, but it has to be located D away in every dimension. So in other words, this will be an infinite plane. Located D away from the origin uh, at uh, Y, Z equals zero. So in other words, anywhere I, I go here in Y and Z, uh, if I stay at X equals zero, then the receiver is still D away. So the reason why this works, this works because The Brownian motion is independent in each dimension. So in other words, the Brownian motion in the Y and the Z direction is independent of the X direction. So I can extract the X component of the motion and everything in Y and Z is the same. Okay, so that's just a way to visualize how things work in higher dimensions. So in other words, our results that we originally applied to um, one dimension still work in three dimensions. But now we're going to do something a little different. We're going to generalize this. So we have to generalize this um, to spatial modulation schemes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, more than one transmitter. They're again going to be point transmitters. Just uh, I'm going to have two, just as an example. You can have as many as you want. And then um, the receiver is going to be a sphere. So again, um, molecules are released at the transmitter, they propagate, and they can end up in either spherical volume over here. The distance we have here to the center of the sphere is still going to be D. Um, the radius of the sphere will be R. Uh, they're going to be the same. So each sphere is going to have radius R. Just for convenience, uh, this distance will again, excuse me, that's not, that's not right. The, um, the distance isn't to the center, it's to the edge. Oops. And there will be a distance of H between the spherical boundaries. Okay, so in this circumstance, um, it, has been sh it has been shown, we will not show, uh, but for a single, uh, absorbing receiver, uh, excuse me, 3D, absorbing spherical receiver the average number of arriving molecules at time t is given by, and again, I will uh, draw the um, environment here. So that is D, that is R, uh, 
So the average number of arriving molecules, I'm going to give this um, the function f of t as a function of parameters r, d, and diffusion coefficient capital D. Uh, so again, that's the diffusion coefficient as usual. This is given by, uh, we're not going to derive this. This has been derived. I'll give you a reference later. Uh, actually, I will put the reference in these notes uh, once I upload them. R over R plus D, Earth C, D over root 4 D T. Okay, so now we know uh, basically this is uh, this is in some sense the impulse response of the system. If you release molecules uh, from here at time t, or excuse me, from here at time zero, um, the number that you will receive is given by this r over r plus d or c d over four d t. All right, so that lets us set up a hybrid modulation scheme. We haven't talked formally about hybrid modulation schemes just yet, but let's talk about hybrid modulation schemes. And MIMO. So remember if we had pure uh, spatial modulation, then we would only be encoding information in space. But now we're, in, we're gonna encode information in space, amplitude, and time. So what we're going to, what we're going to end up with is a sequence of symbols Um, for each um, transmit antenna. These will be in discrete time. With symbol interval TS. Uh, before I used TS as the sample time, but it's consistent. Um, the sample time can also be the symbol time um, if you send a second symbol immediately afterwards. So the kind of the kind of setup we're looking at here. Again, we have our uh, just for example, we have two transmitters, two receivers. They are both spherical. And what we're going to do is we're going to in input sequences x1 and x2. And x1 and x2 will consist of numbers of released molecules. So in other words, uh, let's say, for example, x1 is equal to 0, uh, 1, 1, 0, 1. Um, what that would mean is that in the first symbol interval, we send no molecules. At the beginning of the second one, we send 1. At the beginning of the third one, we send 1. At the beginning of the fourth one, we send 0. At the beginning of the fifth one, we send 1. And again, we could potentially have a different sequence at the second um, uh, at the second uh, transmitter. So here, it's a zero and one, one and zero, and so on, and they both release a molecule in the fifth time interval. So something like that. So you can see how this would set up 
um, a hybrid modulation scheme because I am sending information um, in time and with amplitude, but also in space because these are different. So much like in conventional MIMO systems, I'm going to define a channel response And I'm going to define it S I J of K. And this is defined as the probability that a molecule released from transmitter. I is received by receiver J in the kth symbol interval. Um, in the previous lecture, we noted that probabilities um, could also represent uh, impulse responses if the number of molecules was sufficiently large. So we dealt with that in the previous class. So you can think of this, it's, it's, it's um, convenient to think of it as a probability for analytical purposes. Uh, in, order, in other words, in order to derive it, it's, it's appropriate to think of it as a probability. But um, for analyzing MIMO communication systems, you can also think of this as the impulse response. So this is also the impulse response. if the number of molecules is large. So this lets us set up um, our MIMO matrices. What we'll end up with is, um, well, if you think about it for a moment, if I consider the number of molecules arriving at antenna one, um, or the expected number of molecules arriving at antenna one. I'll just, instead of writing expected value, I'll just write the, the number and just make the expected value implicit. That will be the number, sorry, at time K. That will be the number transmitted from antenna one at time K times S11, departing from one arriving at one at time K plus um, the number departing from time two, time k, s uh, departing two, arriving at one, k, plus a noise term. So uh, the noise, uh, the noise will allow us to uh, convert from, I mean, we talked about noise in, in the last lecture. We talked about counting noise as a data dependent Gaussian noise. And that's basically what this will end up being. Uh, similarly, Y2 of K is X1 of K, S21 of K plus X2 of K, S22 of K plus Z2. Now, uh, you'll notice that we ignore ISI, and I'm going to ignore ISI for the purposes of this lecture simply because um, we have to simplify things in order to fit in the time allowed. So uh, to be clear, we're going to ignore ISI. ISI is actually a huge, a huge issue for these systems, so uh, my ignoring ISI is not to suggest that it's not important. It's just that we don't have time to talk about it. So we end up with the matrix equation. 
y1, y2. Uh, I'm going to eliminate the dependence on k, just make that implicit. This will be s11, s12. Sorry, correction. Let me just make sure I'm getting this right. This should be S21, S12, S22 times X1, X2 plus my noise. So again, uh, the noise term is data dependent, counting noise. It could also be, uh, there could also be other sources of noise. All right, so if we know all of these quantities, then the simplest way to detect the signal is simply zero force. So actually there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can possibly detect, um, you, in which you can possibly detect uh, a signal, um, a MIMO signal, but um, just for simplicity and uh, in the interest of time, let's just talk about zero forcing. So what we're gonna do, um, let me just write this. There are many possible uh, detectors. For MIMO systems. But here, we will focus on zero forcing. And basically what, I, what happens there is the following. Uh, so again, redrawing my equation. I can define my terms here. So this will be the vector y equals the matrix, I'm going to call it H, the vector X plus the vector Z. So in zero forcing, we invert H. So in other words, we multiply on the left by H inverse. H will generally be invertible uh, because, at least in this uh, scheme, um, the uh, the receivers, your cross receivers will be further away than your than your true receivers. So these elements will be larger than those. So this matrix should be invertible. So it'll be H, sorry, just a sec. H inverse Y is equal to X plus H inverse Z. So this, it's the linear combination of Gaussian noises. So this will still be Gaussian. We now have our um, signal without uh, cross terms. So this is just the pure signal. Uh, and so basically this has been accomplished by, by um, linear operations. <clears throat> it's not, uh, it's actually not the best way to do this. And I've also not described anything about how to design the signal for MIMO, but this will work quite well. Just want to uh, finish this part of the lecture with some concepts. One is for, uh, the analysis of molecular MIMO is exceedingly complex. So uh, basically what I just showed you were some ways to analogize it to wireless MIMO, but um, Molecular MIMO 
is quite complex. There are many issues that have to be dealt with. So for example, one is that the molecule counts at the receivers are not independent. That's kind of a big one. If you think about how that works, if a molecule is counted in here, then it's not over there. So in other words, uh, the, the, um, the counting noise is actually dependent. in a way that is actually kind of annoying and hard to deal with. Um, ISI is a major consideration. So we skated through it. We didn't really talk about it at all. Um, but techniques that you can use to uh, mitigate ISI, you can modify the transmitter uh, waveform to minimize ISI, like you can pre-code something like that. You can do molecular pre-coding. <clears throat> uh, you can also adjust the threshold at the receiver. But this is in fact, uh, dealing with ISI is actually the biggest factor in uh, designing the receiver. It, it turns out to be a very complex problem because of the very long tails. Um, and it's not feasible to wait for ISI to die, to die out. Um, so that gives you a very brief and uh, high level introduction to the idea of molecular MIMO, but it should be clear um, that there's plenty to do, and there's in fact plenty of uh, research activity to do. Nonetheless, the gains, if you read the papers, are quite impressive, and it's certain that this will, uh, that molecular MIMO is a, a useful technique for increasing the uh, information rate of MIMO systems, or excuse me, of molecular communication systems. Um, so I, uh, I would encourage you to check out that literature. Um, I'm going to put right here, as I mentioned a second ago, in my notes, I'm going to put a, uh, a reference to the paper um, that I uh, based part of this lecture on. It'll give you far more information than I've given you here.